One of the, the absolutely pathologic situations for any animal or human is to be able to access repeated dopamine surges without effort or any pursuit that's self-directed and or that's directed, I should say. So for instance, cocaine, a drug which potently increases dopamine or methamphetamine, which potently increases methamphetamine, but doesn't require any sort of um, adaptive action pursuit except to acquire the drug and spend money on no it. No sacrifice. No sacrifice. So what, essentially what ends up happening is the circuit that gets rewarded is only the drug seeking behavior and no other behavior will give the kind of potent yeah. dopamine release that cocaine or methamphetamine will, which is why they are so pernicious. Now, likewise, right, right. I'm not- Well, plus, plus they have that powerful reinforcing effect, right. right? So not only do you get that kick, but what's reinforced by the dopamine release is the behaviors that were right prior, particularly right prior to the ingestion. And if it all that is, is the drug taking behavior, that's all that develops. That's right. You build that monster inside your head. That's right. So I can see where you're going on the pornography. Front. Right. So I was starting to get a lot of questions. I was kind of surprised. I thought, well, you know, I'm male and, you know, maybe that's why they feel comfortable asking. But if you were saying that we're asking about pornography and they were asking, you know, I, I, I realize we want to, um, you know, to, I'll just be direct about it. They were asking whether or not masturbation was bad. They were asking whether or not um, masturbation with ejaculation was particularly bad. And here's my stance on this. I'm a biologist and a neuroscientist, not a psychologist. But what we know for sure is that if an individual repeatedly engages in this circuitry, let's say, say masturbation and pornography with increasingly um, potent forms of stimulation, that are on a screen, yep. a couple of things happen. First of all, what's being reinforced? What's being reinforced is a high dopaminergic response to watching other people engage in sexual behavior, which is very different than being in a first person sexual experience, okay? So right there, you know that what's being reinforced is not actually any kind of improvement in communication yeah, skills. It's voyeurism. It's voyeurism. And, and as these questions started to come in more and more, I started to realize there was a lot of kind of undertones of people talking about fear of or experience with sexual dysfunction that clearly pornography yeah, can lead yeah. to. And here I'm specifically talking about males. I, I actually don't know the literature on females. So here I'm talking about- Females don't use visual pornography to the same degree. I see. They use literary pornography. I see. So, yeah, yeah. so, and then you start to think about, okay, what happens in the cascade or the arc of, of sexual arousal and, and orgasm? What happens is that initially there's a, a it's parasympathetically dominant, meaning if somebody is too uh, stressed, they actually can't engage in sexual behavior. The arousal response doesn't occur. The erection is blunted, but the actual orgasm response and ejaculation is strongly associated with the so-called sympathetic nervous system, which has nothing to do with sympathy, it has everything to do with, it's a kind of a stress response. And then it reverses to a parasympathetic response. And then a hormone called prolactin increases dramatically after ejaculation in males. What does that do? That blunts dopamine release and testosterone for a very long period of time, which makes sense if pair bonding and sort of, you know, in our species anywhere, there's this idea that then other molecules would be exchanged with partners, pair bonding, potential for raising mates, etc. Without getting into a huge discussion about that, the point is this, masturbation and pornography are potently tapping into the dopamine system and can undermine the very processes of which I consider healthy processes of finding a mate, you know, dating, communication, eventually, if it's appropriate, sexual well, interaction, it et cetera. Like it's undermining pair bonding. And pair well, bonding. So, okay, so here's a question. If, if, you're, if you're seeking sexual release through pornography and you go through the whole cycle and you get a prolactin release, do you bond with yourself? Huh. So this is very interesting. The, um, it's, the biology explains it as what's left there is a kind of an open loop, a kind of an emptiness right? Because bonding with the self is a, is a complicated notion. I mean, it ha there's a healthy version of that, of course, loving oneself and, yeah. um, and, and yeah, self-referencing. Yeah. And, and again, this is more, uh, your dom far more your domain than mine in terms of uh, what a healthy self-relation is. But in the absence of uh, a real partner there, of an absence of real sexual partner, there's an open loop of neurochemicals, including oxytocin and prolactin. The dopamine, remember, dopamine goes up during pursuit anticipation, then peaks and then crashes below baseline after orgasm and ejaculation. So this kind of low that people fear is putting them into an A-motivated state. We can think of this, if I were to kind of expand on it, would be it's this, it's this kind of um, neurochemical, psychological equivalent of making your home environment filthy for a while. 
not actually putting you into this positive amplification of dopamine. So it depletes the dopamine system. And it's likewise in drugs of abuse and addiction, it eventually depletes the dopamine system. Initially, there's a huge dopamine surge with drugs of abuse like methamphetamine and cocaine. But over time, people are using more and more to achieve what is not such a great high. You even see this a little bit with um, kind of consumption of energy drinks. Like people are taking more and more chemicals within their energy drinks and they're thinking about loud, fast music, energy drinks, this kind of stacking of dopaminergic tools. Now that's not as pathologic. In fact, I'm, I'm, there are some energy drinks I'll occasionally drink and I enjoy them. Um, I don't think we need to be entirely afraid of, of pursuing or engaging in things that release dopamine. Obviously, healthy sexual behavior, food that we love, social engagement, all of these things can be dopaminergic. It's the big peaks in dopamine that are not associated with any prior effort or organization of self that are particularly dangerous for the human being. Yeah, well, you could see that, that you could see that, that that's a cardinal danger of, of uh, affluence then. That's right, this is why the children of- right. uh, You know, you know- That's right. You, you know, you cannot get rats addicted to cocaine if they live in their natural environments. Is that right? You can only get rats addicted to cocaine if they're isolated rats in a cage. Yeah, they won't bar press for cocaine in the natural environment, and it's because they have alternative sources of dopaminergic gratification. Very interesting. So, yeah, yeah the, it's very interesting. Yeah, the children of very wealthy people who are overindulged, I, I've seen that many times, many, many times, and it is a very sad sight. Um, yeah, well, they're not optimally deprived, eh? And that, that issue of optimal deprivation, that's, that's a killer issue for an affluent society.